Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, let's pray. Uh, may we pray? Most gracious God, uh, you promised to be present with us in your holy word, in mystery, in understanding, um, in touching us in spirit, not just so that we might be aware, but so that we might be changed. So open us up, we pray. Help us to focus on your word uh, to these congregations in the region of Galatia that Paul addressed so long ago, that we might um, not only be aware of what they were going through and what maybe perhaps it meant to them, but what it might mean to us to live in freedom of the gospel and in proper perspective toward both law and gospel. Um, we pray along with whatever concerns we have uh, personally and for our congregations and families. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, then. Um, I am going to jump right in. I, I think that I heard that Lexi started the recording, which is a good thing um, uh, for, for all those outside dwellers this evening. And uh, I am going to, are you seeing that? Give me a thumbs up, a nod. Yes, okay. Uh, so uh, wonderful. Uh, we are going to be looking at chapter four, but just like um, uh, just like last week, I want to do a little bit of a uh, background stuff, and I, I didn't want to assume this. It's not something that I think um, most people probably most of the time, even if they've read it before in the small catechism, uh, remember. But I think that when we talk about law and gospel, which is one of the marks of being a Lutheran, that we are both a law and gospel um, church, uh, when we preach, when we proclaim, uh, we proclaim law and gospel. Uh, and what is the perspective of that? And so really, uh, St. Paul's letter to the Galatians really helps us begin to, to formulate that. It helps Martin Luther begin to formulate that. But uh, if you talk about the three uses of the law, um, the first use of the law, uh, Martin Luther said in the small catechism, was to help control violent outbursts of sin in the world, just a curb, or or even uh, some people would say a hammer, <laughs> you know, boom, you will do this because this is what I am almighty God, and, and this is what I require of you. Um, but because of the reality of sin, we just need the law, uh, just like any organization, as we spoke last week, needs um, guidelines and boundaries, uh, a world with no boundaries, uh, might be a fun world for just a moment, but before long, um, we would feel very vulnerable and probably exploited or be exploiters uh, or both, depending on uh, with whom we are interacting. So the curb, it, it keeps us uh, uh, in, in line and makes us aware. Second, the law accuses us and shows us our sin, how we fall short. You know, Paul says uh, elsewhere, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I believe that's Romans. Um, and uh, so uh, the law is a mirror. How do we even know that we're sinful if there's not a standard uh, up against we, which we measure? Um, that, uh, that this just shows us what is expected of, of us. And when we see that, we can see that we are, in fact, falling short. And third, the law teaches us uh, Christians uh, what we should uh, what we should be about uh, to live a God pleasing life, uh, a guide, not because we have to, but in freedom to choose to follow in that way. Um, uh, and in that sense, the power of the law actually belongs to the gospel. Um, if you if you read some of Paul's longer, more developed letters like Romans, um, uh, it's always uh, this this pattern of argument because, 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 because uh, the gospel is always saying, you know, because and 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 the subject then is because God is doing this because God has done this because God continues to do this. Therefore, you know, uh, like like chapter eight in Romans, you, you you know, you get all the cause in the first seven uh, chapters, and then you get therefore, uh, and now so in response to this law, not again because we have to in order to make um, God do this. It's not a, 
it's not an if then, right? Um, the law is very much by itself an if then proposition. If you eat all your peas, maybe I will give you a popsicle. Um, you know, if you uh, successfully complete all of these assignments, uh, then maybe you will pass this course if you, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, and, and again, that doesn't mean law bad. It, that's, that's a necessary thing in human interaction to have those standards and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but, but the proper way that Lutherans think about it, um, and that I believe Paul is very much about, is because God, uh, and so the gospel always really has God, Jesus, or Holy Spirit as the subject, uh, and what God is doing, delivering, rescuing, saving. Uh, and that's not just a New Testament thing, because again, how how do we most profoundly know God um, in, in what we might call the Old Testament or the Old Covenant? Well, God is whoever rescues Israel from Egypt. That's who God is. Um, the Genesis texts uh, are not nearly as old as the Exodus text. That is the key and foundational. So, so God is um, um, not totally unlike um, Domino's um, pizza. Uh, God is always the God who delivers. God is always the God who saves. And then we struggle with the therefore uh, because we because we wish to be pleasing out of love and grace, not out of fear and uh, and threat. Um, so that, just to catch you up to where we where we ended up last week. And again, if you have questions, if you'll type them into the chat, I think Catherine's here, uh, Lexi's here, Catherine will jump in and interrupt me and say, hey, 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 stop, Tim. Um, we have a question here from so-and-so. Because uh, as I'm sharing my screen, I can only see like two of you. Um, so last week we ended, uh, as many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. Um, so putting on the garment of Christ, remember the baptismal imagery. There's no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, no longer male and female. Uh, all of you are one in Christ Jesus. That is just stunning. It, it, it truly is stunning in terms of ultimate realities out of which we live our present um, penultimate or not ultimate all the way realities. Um, that that these distinctions have gone away because of Christ. Um, if you belong to Christ, which he's saying, and you do, then you are Abraham's offspring. You are heirs according to the promise. Uh, and then he's going to contrast as we jump into chapter four, which is our topic for this week. Um, so, so now picking up on that, where we start this week, uh, Paul says, my point is um, that um, as long as, as they are minors, they're no better than those who are enslaved, which if you think of a trust that kicks in um, when somebody's 25 years old or 18 years old, you may well be um, you know, very wealthy or millionaire or whatever, um, technically and legally, but you are not yet of age, and so you're living under the, um, uh, still under somebody's guardianship. I mean, <laughs> think about all that was in the news about um, Britney Spears and uh, you know uh, the the arrangements that they had about the trusteeships and everything, and how she was exploited because of that. Um, but uh, they remain under guardians and trustees um, uh, until the, the date is set by the father. So with us, while we were minors, that's what he's considering living under the law, living under the rules of Judaism. Actually, we were enslaved to the elemental principles of the world. Um, so... Uh, elemental principles, that, that Greek word stoicheia, um, is a strange word. It can mean a set of guidelines or rules or basic principles. It also can mean just as fully um, demonic powers. And I think likely um, Paul means the latter, demonic powers right here. So these elemental, these demonic powers, we're enslaved to them. But when the fullness of time had come, who, by the way, is a person, Jesus, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, 
Okay, so born of a born of a woman means uh, human. Uh, born under the law means Jewish. In order to redeem those who were under the law, and that is an intentional past tense um, in in Paul's Greek to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. Um, which is a beautiful image, isn't it? Um, that uh, that if we think of being especially very small or young children or babies, uh, this adoption um, is not anything that we have any agency over. It is simply something that is done uh, for us. And now, because you are children, we are children of God, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, uh, and of course, Abba being an Aramaic word, uh, most Jews uh, of the day, like Paul was, um, and Jesus and others uh, in everyday conversation did not really speak Hebrew. They spoke a very related language of Aramaic, uh, but the word Abba, and some people say, say it's, it's father is too formal of a translation, uh, pops, um, dad, um, a, a close and intimate relationship that uh, that we are beloved as children. Now, Paul develops that theme, uh, just like especially uh, the gospel writer John uh, and the, the letters of John uh, are very much um, emphasize being children of God. So, so here's the thing. You're not a slave anymore, like under the law, but now you're a child. And if you're a child, that means you are an heir. And, and Paul's going to develop that at the end of the chapter as well, when he talks about uh, Hagar birthing Ishmael and Sarai birth, birthing um, uh, Isaac, uh, but but this idea that we are uh, we are heirs, um, so we we inherit a promise not because we've been so great, but because of a relationship. It's entirely relational. Um, it's not transactional, if that makes sense. Uh, it, it's relational. And, and I, I don't think that we can overemphasize emphasize that. So this is uh, um, from Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians on this section. Uh, Luther says, our conscience was subject to the law, uh, which exercised its tyranny over us with all its might. It whipped us as a tyrant whips his captive slave. And remember, Luther struggle mightily on a personal level. This is not academic for Martin Luther. Uh, I mean, he really, really, he really needed a therapist, some kind of bad. Um, but that just wasn't what we know as therapy didn't exist in that particular world. He had a father confessor, but in a nutshell, he just felt like God requires us to be good in order to be uh, assured of the fullness of uh, the reign of God. And uh, and yet I know for a fact that I cannot be who God requires of me. So what kind of God is jerking us around in that kind of a way? Uh, it even invented a German word that Luther made up called Anfechtungen, which just means deep, deep foundational despair that there is no hope. And that's where Luther was living um, and then discovering in a similar vein to what Paul uh, is talking about, uh, his hope in the grace of God. Um, because what is it when if we're threatened with eternal death and damnation, you better be good enough. If you're not good enough, God's going to get you. Um, and who's good enough? Uh, you know, this, this lasts until Christ comes. But as so long as Christ is absent, we're slaves, confined under the law, lacking grace, uh, faith, and all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But after Christ comes, the imprisonment and slavery of the law come to an end. Um, so uh, so it, it is all about um, Christ. Now, keep in mind, and I don't want to just like totally blow your mind, but when you later read, which is another 50 or more years after Galatians is written, John really uh, began, the gospel of John begins to put forth uh, a really stunning uh, proposition or proclamation, and that is 
that Christ exists before the foundation of the world, right? In the beginning was what? The word, W-O-R-D. And the word was with God. The word was God. Well, yes, if I'm Jewish, I'm thinking that that makes total sense because how did God bring everything into being? Uh, God didn't sprinkle pixie dust. God didn't wave a magic wand. Um, God spoke everything into being. Let there be, you know, let there be Susan Bauer. And there was Susan Bauer. Uh, there, there's just, no, it's, it's that God calls everything that is into being. And then fast forward to John chapter one, verse 14, and the word became flesh. This pre-existent word that brought everything in the universe into being actually is the Christ um, that then at this end of the ages becomes flesh in the person of Jesus um, and to the fullness of, of promise. So, uh, you know, but we were held confined and captive till Christ comes. As long as he's absent, we're slaves. Um, so that's Luther. Now back to Galatians. This law and gospel contrast, this freedom and enslavement contrast. Now, formerly, you know, when you didn't know God, because these people in the churches of Galatia were pagans. They weren't. Uh, they weren't. They weren't Jewish. Uh, formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to beings that, by nature, are not gods. Maybe you had lots of gods, but they weren't. I mean, they were. They, they weren't real. Um, but now, however, that uh, that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God, um, that God is the active agency here that it's not like later on the the greek uh gnostics that it was all about the more we know and the knowledge but see for a hebrew person we already know from the get-go that knowledge is not the be-all and the end-all as marvelous as it is because what was the tree that they weren't supposed to eat of <laughs> the tree of knowledge of all good and evil i'll know everything yeah you can't handle that um uh so you are limited. Um, so now, but but now that you have been known by God, how, tell me, people, and this is where Paul kind of transitions to making this not just a logical, rational, uh, literary kind of argument or even sermon, but very personal. How can you want to be enslaved to them again? You I watch you all and I hear reports and you're observing special days and months and seasons and years. What does he mean by that? You know, you're, you're doing all the, uh, all the ancient festivals and uh, Jewish feast days and, uh, and fasts and all of these things because some Judaizers have come in and told you that if you don't do that, just like the circumcision thing, if you don't fulfill all these things, then uh, who knows, maybe you might make it in, but then you'll, you'll be a second class um, Christian because we all know that you have to be Jewish first. And now what does Paul say? Um, and we, you know, he starts to center himself a bit. I'm afraid my work for you may have been wasted. Um, I mean, he's disgusted. Um, you know, how, how could you do such a thing? And he's not finished yet either. He is not finished. Um, beginning with, uh, with verse 12. Friends or brothers, uh, I beg you, become as I am. For I also have become as you are. Okay, what in the world? Become as I am? What? Well, Paul says that to the Corinthians. Uh, again, he is not short on ego. Uh, but he is also not afraid to use himself as an example um, to say, if you're struggling with this, just watch, watch me. I'll show you how you do this. Um, you know, I, I have become as you are. He's talking to Gentile Christians. 
who are struggling with whether or not they have to be Jewish because people are telling them they do. Um, how did Paul become as they are? He doesn't observe the Gentile dietary laws, uh, the compulsion to be in synagogue on the Sabbath, which is not Sunday, but Saturday. Um, uh, and he's like, okay, you, you haven't done anything wrong to me. You know, and then um, he's almost playing a sympathy card here, but maybe he's just putting it all out there. Presumably it's sincere. You know that it was because of a physical infirmity that I first announced um, this to you, though my condition put you to the test. Now, we do not know what Paul's physical infirmity was. Um, there's much, much, much speculation about it, but elsewhere, you know, he refers to it as a thorn in the flesh. But early on in these very, very earliest writings, he refers to it there too. There's something, I mean, again, who, who knows? People have speculated that maybe he was uh, epileptic, uh, but they would not have had a word for that. Um, uh, uh, or that he, you know, uh, he he had some kind of something that really made uh, his life uh, challenging in addition to all the other things he might have chosen to do. And he says to them, when even though that was tough for you as I came among you, you didn't scorn me or despise me, but you welcomed me. Remember when I said he didn't butter him up at the beginning? Well, now he is for just a bit. You welcomed me as an angel of God. Uh, really in Greek, messenger and angel are basically the same word. Um, so you welcomed me as a messenger of God, an angel of God. You welcomed me as you would Christ Jesus, because I'm the one who made him known to you. But now he flips in verse 15. So now what? What happened to that goodwill that you felt toward me that you endured all of my physical infirmity and everything else that made it so tough for you because I'm going to tell you had it been possible I'm telling you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me um do you remember that you know that that you you would do all these things and now have I verse 16 become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth they make much of you they the Judaizers. Yeah, they're they're making a lot about you. They're they're giving you a lot of attention. They act like they're trying to help you, but for no good purpose. They're up to no good. They want to exclude you so that you may make much of them. Oh, look, here we are, poor lowly Gentile Christians. You know, we wish we could be as special and as important as the Jewish Christians. Um, but wow, we could never live up to that. They want you to to think they are somehow better than you. Um, verse 18, it's good to be made much of for a good purpose at all times, and not only when I'm present with you. My little children, that great endearment now, for whom I am again in the pain of childbirth, I mean, it was hard being with you and and bringing you all through the proclamation that I brought to you so patiently, you know, that that was the pains of childbirth. And now I'm having to give birth to you again because you went backwards until Christ is formed in you. So I wish I were present with you now and could change my tone. Because be honest with you, I'm perplexed about you. I, I don't know what to do. You see how human this is? I mean, it started out so kind of removed and philosophical, and now uh, it's very personal. This is kind of what it reminds me of, the guy dumping the lobster in the, in the boiling pot. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to have this ill will toward you, but I, you know, it's because I love you, you know, that I'm having to tell you these things, my little children. I wonder if this man's calling the lobsters little children as he puts them in the pot. Um, but commenting on this particular section, uh, Luther says, um, 
And remember, <laughs> that commentary on Galatians is really long. So he reflects and writes a whole lot on very few verses. Do not regard me as your enemy because I've scolded you severely, but regard me as your father. Uh, now, remember, this is 500 years ago uh, that Luther's writing this. For if I did not love you intensely as my own children and know that I was very dear to you, I would not scold you so severely. Um, I don't know. It just made me think of that. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. So, uh, and that's Luther. And, and again, I'm giving you a lot of Luther this time, but a lot of who most of us are Lutherans uh, who are in this Bible study. And uh, and I think it's really, really helpful to to have, to make the connections about how important is Galatians is uh, and then later Romans, which, as I've said many times, Romans is like Galatians unpacked a little more um, and uh, and to a different group of people, uh, the Romans who, um, you know, who are even maybe not neutral, but even kind of persecuting um, uh, Christians to some degree. So we do get uh, this, uh, he keeps, I think he's also kind of literarily leading us up to this analogy. Hey, Little Bishop children. Tim? Yeah. I am going to interrupt you because we, we do have a question. Yes. Um, a couple now. It just took people a minute to get their yeah, sure. thoughts it, it, that's together. How that's how mm -hmm. it works. So Susan Bauer is asking, could Paul be doubting his effect effectiveness as a messenger? Well, I I think that Paul could. Um, uh, it's not the first thing that jumps, that leaps to my mind, um, as I am aware of other Pauline pieces of scripture. Um, uh, but certainly, yeah, I, I mean, I think we all, to some degree or another, have a bit of insecurity that if we've done it good enough, or w where did I fail you, you know, um, uh, the the classic um, sort of Jewish mother syndrome and, the, the, you know, in, in comedy where, you know, uh, you know, after all I've done for you, and, and this is how you treat your mother, you know, um, you know, that, uh, th that, uh, or, or that I, you know, I've failed you somehow. And, uh, you know, that, so certainly um, any of that humanity is possible uh, because I think that it's, I don't think he's feigning this deep love and affection for these folks. I think he's, he truly, truly, and these are his first people. These are his babies. <laughs> these are his firstborn. Um, this, this is his church. And think how you, or, or even if not you, some other people, in your congregation think about their church um well yeah maybe maybe in the big picture jesus is head of this church but this is my church you know um uh it's easy to feel that way i i feel that and it and it can be a good thing um but but certainly also uh carlos cavazos is asking uh, could his physical infirmity may be the stoning that almost left him dead and the physical damage that resulted it, it certainly could be um there could have been um uh there could have been some brain damage there you know stoning is a horrible thing um you know uh you know he was uh he was more uh involved as the stoner instead of the stony um yeah you know with, with Stephen and others and uh, we we do have uh, uh indications that Paul was was leading those realities but yes it could have been from some sort of a punishment I, I don't think he ever says that something was from birth so whatever it was might have been something that came later including an injury or a persecution uh of some sort yeah, for, for absolute sure. And and again, so much of this, wow, it would be great to know. But 
but we just don't know um, uh, definitively. Um, I mean, this was a long, long time ago, um, and he doesn't he doesn't choose to tell us what that is. Um, Thanks. Those were our two questions. Oh yeah. Well, let me jump on then to uh, this Hagar and Sarah. Um, do you remember? And I hope you're seeing that. But um, do you remember the Abram story? Because uh, remember that we started out in Galatians with the analogy of Abraham or Abram. And what was it that made Abram so righteous before God? In other words, why did why did God choose? Abram. Um, and, and the big argument that Paul makes on the freedom of the gospel and on it having entirely to be grace and promise is we don't know anything at all about Abram, except he was from what we would now call uh, Iraq, um, where he had moved there, uh, almost by definition, because everyone in the ancient world would have been, um, you know, worshiping multiple gods, would have been what we might call uh, a pagan, or uh, uh, and 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 Abram suddenly is is the one, um, and I think you maybe remember the story Abram and Sarai, and they're old and they don't have any children, and in the in the ancient world, not just in Judaism, your hope for the future, there was no pie in the sky by and by, uh, there was not this sense of heaven. Uh, really, per se, uh, that was developed later on, um, maybe a hundred years before Jesus, actually in <clears throat> Pharisaism. You know, the Pharisees were the ones who believed in in a resurrection of some kind, af life after death. The Sadducees were absolutely clear that they did not. And so we often, you know, in Sunday school, say the Pharisees and the Sadducees as if they're together, but that's a pretty big gap. You know, there's a, there's resurrection. No, there's not. Um, so they don't just always go together. Sometimes they conspire against Jesus. But um, so in, in this whole Abram story, it's all the promise, all the promise. He believed God. It was reckoned to him, judged, proclaimed to him as righteousness. He is righteous because he believes. And then Luther, remember, says, Oh, well, yeah, but there at least is one one work that you have to do. You know, you don't have to do anything. It's all grace. It's all grace. And all you have to do is believe. And Luther was very clear. Um, no. You know why? Because I believe I cannot by my own understanding or effort believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him, but the Holy Spirit. So faith itself, that is the requirement to be a recipient of the promise is a gift of God. Um, uh, it becomes, I understand, somewhat circular, uh, but that has always been, uh, both in Judaism and in, um, in Christendom, uh, for those who emphasize promise and grace, it's always all gift and grace. So Abram and Sarai, remember the angels come and uh, tell Abraham that they're going to have a baby, and they're like 90, and uh, Sarah is listening, and she laughs, and that's why they have to name him Isaac, Yitzhak, um, because it means um, she laughed, um, uh, and, and then, so, but, but, but part of the problem is there's also a slave woman. Remember Hagar, the, the slave who before Isaac comes along, that Ishmael is born, um, which becomes problematic in the Abrahamic sort of faith traditions because he's always seen as the forerunner and the basis of what becomes Islam or the Muslim faith, uh, which all comes back to Abraham in their commonality. But there's the the child of the law and the child of the promise is what Paul is saying. So are you not going to listen to the law since you want to be subject to it? Because it's written that Abraham had two sons, one by an enslaved woman, Hagar, the other by a free, free woman, Sarai. 
And one, the child of the enslaved woman, was born according to the flesh. Uh, the other, the child of the free woman, was born through the promise. Uh, that could mean a number of things, and some people make a big deal about it. Uh, was born according to the flesh, meaning fleeting things, temporary, ephemeral things. Um, uh, but uh, the other, the child of the free woman was born through the promise. Well, first of all, it's impossible. So it has to be through the promise. Um, and then, then he says, now, okay, I'm going to tell you, this is an allegory. Uh, these women are the two covenants. And this is not like the Old Testament and the New Testament, by the way, meaning the two covenants, the law and the promise. You can say law and gospel, law and promise, law and freedom. It would all mean the same thing in my mind for Paul and Galatians. One woman, in fact, is Hagar from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. Now, we have no idea from any scripture or Jewish midrash writing in between the time of uh, what we call the Old Testament and when Paul is writing, that would indicate that Hagar is from Mount Sinai. But why is Paul using that? Uh, because Mount Sinai is where Moses got what? The law, the Ten Commandments. Um, so Hagar equals the law. Um, and so uh, then uh, continuing on with verse 25, um, we then come to uh, now Hagar is is mount sinai in arabia and corresponds to the present jerusalem now what does that mean um hagar is the law and she corresponds to jerusalem because remember it's the jerusalem christians who presumably are sending the judaizers who are saying no nah, you really would do better to become jewish first or maybe you really have to and get circumcised and so on and remember Peter and James, the brother of Jesus, are back in the Jerusalem church, and they have that Jerusalem council, and they let Paul go to the Gentiles as long as he sends money, and they kind of shake hands and say, we're on the same team, but um, but we don't see everything the same, um, and then you get that whole deal where uh, they've, they've agreed that, yes, the Gentiles can be, just be baptized and become Christians without becoming Jewish, but then when Peter and James and others kind of hang out with Gentiles, they start not eating with them because they don't want to be defiled by being too close to this non-Jewish food. And so really by their actions, if not their words, they're saying, yeah, it would really be better if you weren't Jewish. We're, we're the better Christians, um, the more real Christians. We were here first. Um, every time somebody is, makes a complaint to me um, from a congregation, uh, the first thing they do is give me their credentials. My great-grandfather laid the bricks for this church. Um, and there are these people here who just joined like 18 years ago, and they think they get to run the place now. But my great-grandfather laid the bricks here, and my family's been here all along, and they're all buried in the cemetery. I'm not making this up. We We tend to think that whoever got there first somehow is extra special but jesus told all kinds of parables about that you remember like the workers in the vineyard and the ones who came with just an hour left in the day got paid the same thing that everybody else did um credentials and and history and uh heritage are wonderful beautiful things but in the in the fullness of the reign of god in christ they don't make you more special the other woman corresponds to the Jerusalem above, the heavenly Jerusalem. That's Sarah. She's free, and she is our mother. Because it's written, rejoice, you childless one, you who bear no children, burst into song, shout, you who endure no birth pangs. For the children of the desolate woman are more numerous than the children of the one who is married. Um, uh, I think that's uh, Psalm 118, maybe. Um, and now you... My siblings are, are children of the promise, like Isaac. See, you Gentiles in the region of Galatia, you are children of the promise, what I've been trying to tell you all along. Listen to me. 
just as uh, uh, the time the child who was born according to the flesh persecuted the child who was born according to the spirit. Now, again, there's no scripture that says Ishmael persecuted um, uh, persecuted Isaac, but there is Jewish, what they call Midrash. I always think it sounds like what you get when you have Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but that's not. Midrash is a is a Jewish sort of rabbinical reflection and set of writings that were not uh, considered scriptural, but they were con considered authoritative uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and those would did refer to Ishmael persecuting Isaac. Um, but what does the scripture say? Drive out the enslaved woman and her child. For the child of the enslaved woman will not share the inheritance with the child of the free woman. I think that's Isaiah. Um, so then, siblings, we are children. Children, 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 like I've been calling you, little children, remember, endearments. Not of an enslaved woman, but of the free woman. And then... This section, even though it begins a new chapter, really chapter 5, verse 1, goes with this section. Um, and this is, um, I just think that this is an amazing proclamation by Paul, um, and it really, really meant a lot to Luther and the Lutheran movement. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Christ has not set us free to return to the law. Christ set us free for freedom. Um, remember that line in Big Fat Greek Wedding? <laughs> Obscure, right? When Tula, the, the woman who wants to marry the, um, the Presbyterian boy, which is a big no-no for an Orthodox person to do, and her dad just laying down the law and won't let her do it and her mom says this most beautiful thing to her as they're sitting in the bedroom and she says um well among other things she says hey your dad might be the head but i am the neck and the head doesn't do anything that the neck doesn't tell it to do um yeah so so don't don't first of all don't think your daddy's all that um and secondly the mom tells tula her daughter um, I gave you life so that you can live. That's what I want for you. I want you to live. I think Paul is saying that, uh, that same thing. I, I, you know, Paul even uses the birth pangs imagery. I, I gave you life so that you could live. Christ gives us freedom so that we can be free. Don't go back. Stand firm. Therefore, so again, gospel, and therefore law, because Christ in freedom has set us free uh, to be free, stand firm, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now, when the rabbis at Paul's time talked about the yoke of slavery, uh, or the yoke of the law, I should say, they meant that in a good way. But now Paul is using it in a negative way. This this yoke is not a good one. Um, and then, of course, uh, it's hard for us to know what oral tradition about Jesus Paul would have known, not being a disciple or an apostle in Jesus' earthly life, but the, the risen and the resurrected and risen and ascended Jesus appears to him on the road to Damascus. But, um, but we know that Paul, uh, he knew a lot about Jesus. Did he know Jesus's teachings in detail according to oral tradition that was not yet written down in any gospels, at least that we have available? Uh, I, I really truly don't know um, uh, if, if he knew those things, uh, but he would have been familiar um, with a lot of those, um, a lot of those themes, but, but the revelation that came to him was directly from Jesus. Um, now next week is going to be our last week because we didn't want to certainly compete with your Maundy Thursday worship opportunities and everything the, the week after that, two weeks from today. So Easter's creeping up on us, folks. Um, it, it'll be here soon, but next week will be our last week. Um, 
we will be doing uh, chapters five and six. Six is relatively short, and I think we'll have plenty. Of, we've done way more than that in some of these Bible studies before in one evening. Um, I, I don't. We've got uh, we've got about ten minutes, and uh, so if there are comments, thoughts, uh, questions that you might have. Um, then I, I would certainly welcome those and do my best to uh, not necessarily answer them because I don't have all the answers, but address them uh, best I can. Bishop Tim, yeah, I, I was I was thinking to stand firm in uh, Galatians uh, five verse yeah. one might point back to the covenants that are presented of Jerusalem above and Jerusalem now, present Jerusalem, because Abraham and Sarah did not stand firm with God's promise but covenanted with one another in the flesh mm -hmm. to have a child by Hagar in the flesh. Mm -hmm. But God still fulfilled his promise afterwards. In Jerusalem, the priests and the leaders of the law, the elders, are basically covenanting with the people by their laws, the laws that they create, saying that that's what God requires, when in fact God has a different requirement, which is mm -hmm. to believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And they did not see it. Most definitely, you know, Paul is not negating the covenant. You know, if he, like I said, Romans unpacks it a little bit more. Um, and Galatians very briefly dealt with it week before last when, um, you know, the way that he asked it in Romans is, well, then if the law, uh, you know, if, 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 if God's grace abounds because of sin, should we therefore sin all the more so that grace can abound? Um, by no means, uh, you know, because we have been set free. Uh, you read uh, the very first week I quoted Martin Luther on his uh, The Freedom of a Christian, which again is sort of like a commentary on Galatians. Um, but we are set free to do the right thing, if that makes sense. The law, like uh, Ten Commandments and things like that, um, in a lot of ways, just make tremendous sense about living together in community. Um, uh, and we want to be just like if you and I are in a relationship and we uh, we truly deeply care about each other. We love each other in Christ-like love. Then even though I might disagree with you on this or that, or maybe a lot, um, I want to live my life in a way that is pleasing to you because you matter to me. Um, I, th I think that maybe that's a way, one way to think about how we how we live in the freedom of the gospel that rather than threatening us to do the right thing invites us and motivates us because we want to to do the right thing and the right thing hasn't changed uh it's it's so much a matter of motivation and and as as galatians says freedom uh, uh, cuz again like i said the first week you can change my you can change my behavior with a threat. And as a parent and grandparent, I am not above that. Um, my wife may or may not have said to our granddaughter in Asheville at one point when she was using potty mouth terms, um, don't make me come up there and wash your mouth out with soap. This was on a Zoom call. And... Uh, she was pretty sharp, though. She said, you can't because you're not really here. Um, so uh, uh, but but threat can change our behaviors. And I'm not saying that it should not. I think the law as a curb is a good and necessary thing. I think that consequences are good and necessary things. They're just not about the depth of our identity. They're about our behaviors. Um, and it really is tough to make that uh, distinction. Uh, 
but we're called to love everybody, um, not not love every behavior. Um, how much time elapsed between Paul's visit and this letter to the Galatians? Um, maybe talked about that the first week. I think it was uh, maybe four to five years, something like that. That that early, uh, and we're not entirely sure how long he stayed there to begin with, um, but it wasn't like a generation or anything like that. Um, it was, I think it was years you could count on one hand, um, but I don't know the exact number. And we're not, remember, we're not exactly sure that if you kind of superimpose these things that Paul talks about in Galatians with the book of Acts that wasn't written until much later, uh, a generation later, really, um, that describe, you know, the first Jerusalem council, the second Jerusalem council. Well, this meeting with Peter and James was at the first Jerusalem council or the second Jerusalem council. And biblical scholars are not quite sure exactly where it fits. I think I told you the first week, I'm kind of casting my lot that it was the first Jerusalem council. Um, so uh, I think that that's highly likely uh, uh, where that was. But um, I, I hope that maybe as we have a little more time with some of these texts than we've had in some of the past ones, that, that we not just think informationally about this, but that you all begin to do what we call the homiletical or the preaching leap that uh, we're, okay, so so maybe if I'm anywhere close to accurate uh, about what's going on in the region of Galatia and what it means to be a Gentile in that part of the world and what it means to be a Jewish person and then Paul having this conversion experience and going and proclaiming this freedom of the gospel to them, baptizing them, claiming them into the fullness, they're clothed with Christ, all of these wonderful things. And then somebody comes along and says, yes, but let me just tell you, um, I know you're excited and elated and we're happy to have you, but you're not good enough. Um, you're missing some things. In fact, you're missing some pretty crucial and foundational things. You really need to be this. Um, and so this, this wonderful free gift that is showered on them that is so compelling that in droves they convert from their pagan ways to this God who is known in grace and, and in freedom this human tendency to come back to the to the rules and the caste system of um, you know i I love you, but they're my favorite. Um, you know that we just all want to be we we think life is a competition, right? I mean, it just that's what we always default to without even being aware. Um, but but it's not a competition. It's a it's a gracious invitation, and and we don't have the book of Revelation yet because that came almost seventy years probably after this um, was written, or sixty at least. But this vision, just like in the prophet Isaiah, of you know when the glory of the Lord is revealed, that all flesh will see it together, all flesh. Um, remember, Abraham's blessing was always to be a blessing to others. Abraham's blessing was never exclusive. It was a blessing that would find its fulfillment in sharing. Uh, yeah, when are we going to do a Bible study on Revelation? <clears throat> that one would be a, a tough one, but I will tell you, uh, Mary, the simple answer about Revelation is to, and the key, if you want to even look up some things in the meantime, is to understand what apocalyptic literature is. And the point of ap apocalyptic literature, like parts of Ezekiel and 
half of the book of Daniel and the 13th chapter of the gospel of Mark, where people are going through great travail and the, with, with, uh, with all of these uh, persecutions and travail that people of faith are experiencing, the clear word is hang in there. Uh, even though it's not apparent to you, God has got this and God is going to do something new. Um, and it, and they employ all kinds of what seem to us bizarre visions and, you know, like, uh, like the chariot coming down from the sky, you know, um, uh, that kind of thing. But uh, it's, it's not really about something that's going to happen at the end of time. It's very specifically about the reign of Emperor Nero. And that's why the mark of the beast in Revelation is 666. Um, because if you add together the numerical value of all the letters of the emperor's name, it, it adds up to 666. And so it's really complaining about the government and the persecution by the government. And and it's a it's a word of hope to these folks that that at the end, when when the lamb finally comes and slays the beast, um, that that it's all going to be okay. So in a nutshell, there's your Revelation Bible right. study. I appreciate your uh, giving me this opportunity because I enjoy and miss this about parish ministry. So, um, so so thanks uh, thanks a bunch. But I'll start with your question next week. Do I have new insights into Galatians as a bishop? But probably yes. That's a loaded question, Bud, because you worked in a synod office and you know that I do. Um, <laughs> so, but I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit more at the beginning next week. Good night, y'all. Peace to you.